Well, good morning, everybody. We're on the last of the seven churches today, Laodicea. But before we start, could we all stand up? And all turn to the right and then scratch the back of the one in front of you. Come on, Doreen, scratch your back. Now turn back to the left. Back scratch. Okay, one, that's to wake you up. And two, that's to share brotherly love. All right, well, let's get down to the serious business. Firstly, I would like to say that uh, we had a conversation on the phone with Janet this morning. Her asthma is slightly improved, but praise the Lord, she had nine hours good sleep last night. And that is a major progression. She'd like to thank you for, for your prayers. Well, Laodicea, the lukewarm church, Revelation 3, verses 14 to 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, and you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you were lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, well, in order to understand that particular passage, we need to look at what it meant to the people to whom it was written. Because if we try to interpret that from our 21st Western European culture, it makes no sense. But when you look at it in what it meant to the people who read it, then you can transfer the principles to our culture today. But let's have a look first at the city itself. Or switch this thing off. No. Go back one. I don't know which way this thing's going now. The city. That's it. The city of Laodicea is located in Turkey. It was situated in the Lycus Valley, the Lycus River. It's about 45 miles southeast of uh, Philadelphia and about 100 miles east of Ephesus. And it lies between, in the middle, between uh, Heriopolis and Colossae. It had earlier been called Diospolis, yeah, anyway. <laughs> and then Roas. But Antiochus II of Syria named it after his wife Laodike and populated with Syrians and Jews 
who were transplanted from Babylonia to the cities of Phyregia and Lydia. So the original name of the city as we know it came from Antaeus II's wife. But the name has an interesting meaning in Greek. The name is derived from two words, laos, meaning the people, and dike, meaning decision. So saith Strong's Concordance. In other words, the name indicated that people made their own decisions. And as we will see, this was clearly a characteristic of the self-reliant people who lived in this city. Another interpretation is judging by the people, indicating probably a proud and critical attitude which influences their decision. But the complete Jewish Bible suggests that the name means ruling by the people. And along with Colossae and Heriopolis, as one of the cities in the fertile Lycus Valley, there was a great Roman road stretching to the inland of Asia from the coast at Ephesus and it ran straight through the middle of Laodicea. There was also a north-south major Roman road that ran through Laodicea. So it was at the crossroads of two main roads, making it an ideal location for uh, trade and communication. It, like the others, uh, like Thyatira and uh, so, excuse me, it was a military city. It had the best strategic location, but it lacked water, which made it not quite so defensible. It would never stand a siege. Nevertheless, it was renowned for its production of fine quality, glossy black wool, textile, garments and so on. Whether it was dyed or whether it was natural, a little bit uncertain. I mean, the place could have been full of black sheep, we don't know. The city had tremendous banking accent, accent, assets. And that was evidenced by the fact that uh, Cicero cashed huge bank drafts in Laodicea. So wealthy was the city that after the great earthquake of AD 17, which destroyed it, the people refused imperial help. And so with no financial help from Rome, they rebuilt the city out of their own resources. And uh, the Roman historian Tacitus tells us that they did that a second time in AD 60. There was a lot of damage done by another earthquake. And once again, they rebuilt the city out of their own resources with no help from Rome. That would indicate that it was an extremely wealthy city. It also had a famous school of medicine. And there was a special ointment known as Phyregian powder, famous for the cure of eye defects. And it was either manufactured or distributed from there. There were ear ointments. In other words, they were renowned for their medical products. So they've got products that help open the eyes, and they have products that help open the ears. Near the temple they had a, of the special god they had associated with healing, who was known as Ben Karu, he later came to be identified as Asclepius, which is one of the Greek healing gods. There was a market for trading of all sorts of goods Zeus, the supreme god of the Greek pantheon, was also worshipped in the city. So it's a, it's a pagan city. Now the Bible doesn't tell us 
how the church of God became to be established in Laodicea. But one hint that we get is that uh, a faithful minister named Epaphras served this congregation as well as members of Colossae and Heriopolis sometime in the first few decades after Christ's death. In the letter to the Colossians, Paul wrote, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always labouring fervently for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all of the will of God. Remember, this is written to Coloss. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Heriopolis. So it would appear that Epaphras was the man who evangelised and established the Christian church in those three cities. The ruins, now called Eski Hissar, or Old Castle, lie near the modern Gunjeli on the railroad and they've long served as a quarry to the building of the builders of the neighbouring town of uh, Denizili. Among them, nothing before the Roman period has appeared. So uh, the ruins of Laodicea have become uh, a very, very handy source of stone for people building in the nearby uh, towns. That's probably why there's not much of it left, Trip. <laughs> now, I think we need to also understand the political environment. And this relates to the actual, uh, what do I call it, the the appearance of Christ to John and the giving of revelation. The Roman Empire was still in control of most of what was then known, uh, uh, the then known world. The Pax Romana, or Roman peace, ensured good roads, easy travel and ease of commerce. It also included persecution of Christians. Nero persecuted Christians, but that was pretty much restricted to Rome. But by the time of Revelation, the Emperor Domitian had been on the throne for some 12 or 13 years. He had declared himself to be a god and demanded worship once a year as an act of loyalty to Rome. The individual was to stand in front of a statue of Domitian, bow to the ground, and offer incense as an act of worship. And this day was known as the Lord's Day or the Lordly Day. Now remember, John was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. We assume that that was Sunday. But there was a day of the year that was known as the Lord's Day when you were supposed to worship the Emperor of Rome. Christians could not compromise by doing that, and so they suffered for it. Domitian was thankfully murdered in AD 97. The next emperor freed John from Patmos, but he only reigned for little more than a year, and he was succeeded by the emperor Trajan, who was an even greater persecutor of Christians than Domitian. So, Recall in here where Jesus was saying some of the earlier churches in the, in the letters, you know, hang in there. Persecution's coming, but I'm with you. Stay faithful. It's because the persecution was getting worse and worse, or at least he was telling John, it's going to get worse. And of course, we've got the same warning today, haven't we? If we think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. Things are going to get a lot, lot worse before they get better. This world is going to go to pot. People say, oh, no, 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 we've got peace treaties, we've got this, we've got that. No, 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 read the Bible. See what the Bible says. There'll be wars and rumours of wars and there'll be all sorts of persecutions. 
and then Christ shall come. A whole different ball game, but we need to understand that. We don't need to be fearful. We need to look up because your redemption is nearer than when we first believed. You know, for some of us, we've got a lot more behind us than what we've got in front of us. But we still look up. Young people, don't despair. Look up. Keep your focus on Christ. Don't become caught up by all the things of the world. Yes, careers and things like that are important as far as life is concerned, but place Christ first. It was a very dangerous business to be known as a Christian in those days, and it may very well become a dangerous business again. That's one picture of the ruins. I don't know if that's still there, Trev. Another one. You know, when you see things like that, it, it was obviously a pretty prosperous sort of a place to have buildings that would leave ruins like that. And there you'll see where it's located. Towards the bottom of the one that runs from Smyrna through Sardis to Philadelphia, down you'll see Heriopolis, Laodicea and Coloss. And you get the location there. And Ephesus goes down to Magnesia, Magnesia and then the main road goes across through Laodicea across to the east. So it's in a very strategic location. The structure of the letter is the same as the others, the same six-step procedure, although they're not necessarily in this order. There's a description of Christ, his evaluation of the church, criticisms if necessary, advice to the church, praise if any, and encouragement to the overcomers about their eternal future. So let's have a look then at how Jesus describes himself in Revelation 3.14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And once again, Jesus begins by identifying himself as the one giving the message. His name includes the Amen, the faithful and true witness and the beginning of the creation of God. The last name mentioned, the beginning of the creation of God, does not indicate that Jesus was a created being, but that he was the creator. It does not mean that he had a beginning, but that he is the beginning, and therefore he is preeminent over all creation. Amen means it is true, so be it, or may it become true, depending upon whose uh, concordance you read. It's spoken after a prayer or statement to indicate agreement. So when we say amen after a prayer, we're agreeing with what's been prayed. And we're saying, yes, it's true, or so be it, or may it become so. But where Jesus uses it, I think the meaning means truly, truly, I say to you. In other words, when I say this, you've got to listen. In Revelation 1 verse 5, says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins by his own blood. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, in verse 8 says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, 
the Almighty. He is the ruler of all creation. Then we have his evaluation of the church. Well, it's very short. He doesn't have anything good to say about them. Not a thing. But he hasn't abandoned them. And that's the key thing. Even though they weren't doing anything right, they were just lukewarm, they weren't hot, they weren't cold, they just went along, they sat in church and warmed the pew, we might say. But Jesus hasn't abandoned them. He's still interested in them, he still loves them, he still wants to have communion with them, he wants to have a personal relationship with them. His criticism, I know your works, you're neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you were lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I like the King James Version. I'll spew you out of my mouth. <laughs> Much more <laughs> demonstrative. Because you say I am rich, which they were, and have become wealthy, and have no need or have need of nothing. It was as if they placed their reliance on their material wealth. Do not know, and this is the spiritual condition, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. The church was sickeningly warm, lukewarm. The Lord would have preferred it to have been extreme in its indifference or in its zeal. But no, it was lukewarm enough to deceive people into thinking that it was a church of God. I wonder how many churches we have around the world today that are lukewarm enough to deceive people into thinking that they're a church of God, where in fact they're not. Disgustingly lukewarm as to the divine things, and it nauseates the Most High. Furthermore, the church was characterised by pride, Ignorance of its spirit, spiritual condition. So self-sufficient. And they were in worldly things. They rebuilt the city twice. And complacency. There's nothing like complacency to destroy your zeal. I'll spew thee out of my mouth. That's a seemingly harsh saying. But it was one which would have run true to the people of Laodicea because it refers to their water supply. As I said, it was located between Heriopolis and Coloss. And here's a summary of it, I think. I don't know that is going anywhere, Josh. Next one up. Heriopolis had hot mineral springs, which were considered to be medicinal. Coloss was known for its cold, refreshing mountain springs. Laodicea, on the other hand, had a bad reputation when it came to water. It was redound for its dirty, lukewarm water, which visitors immediately spat out after tasting. The thing is, though, you could drink it cold or you could make a nice cup of tea with it. But lukewarm, as it came out of the tap, if you like, 
It was a very effective emetic. It made you vomit. So when Jesus says you're lukewarm, you like your water, you make me vomit. As I said earlier, it was originally built as a frontier fortress. But it lacked a good water supply, so they had to pipe it down from the mineral springs in the mountains. Now, whether they were hot springs and the water just cooled off as it came through, or whether the length of the piping sort of warmed up the water as it went through, we don't know. But however... It was pretty lousy water when it got there. The next one, thanks, Josh. That's the remains of a water pipe at Laodicea. It's not very imposing, is it? But a careful reading of Jesus' admonition reveals that this particular assembly had become focused on riches and wealth with pride and spiritual complacency being the result. So Jesus called the assembly of his followers to repentance and faith. They had sold out to the world and were so sure of themselves because they did not realise the true state of things. I wonder how many preachers today stand up and preach what people want to hear rather than what they need to hear. And there is a big difference. So the state of the church, they were not rich, they were poor spiritually. They were not well dressed, they were naked. They were not self-sufficient, they were truly needy spiritually. They thought they had access to one of the best health centres in the Roman Empire, but in reality they were completely blind spiritually. They invested their valuables in the wrong bank. What is important to realise that this letter is really no different from the six to the other assemblies. The challenge for us is to see that the kind of wealth and comfort mentioned here could only have been achieved if their full participation in pagan Roman society is presumed. If you get involved completely in the things of the world, you will become spiritually blind. That's what had happened to them. A Jesus' reproof should not be taken as being heartless. It wasn't harsh treatment. It's precisely because these people had, their redempt had Christ's redemptive love and commitment that they were challenged to repent and to change their ways. So his advice to the church, I counsel to you to buy of me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Forget about your material wealth. Forget about your material wealth. Concentrate on your spiritual wealth. This is verse 18, 318 that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed. That's the white garments of righteousness, as opposed to their worldly garments that they made, which were so highly prized, of the black wool. That the shame of your nakedness might be revealed. Yes, you're well dressed. You wear the finest clothes, but spiritually you're naked. Get clothed in the robe of righteousness. Seek to invest in the bank of heaven where real treasures exist. Anoint your eyes with eye salve. You reckon you got the stuff that heals the eyes? Well, put a bit of spiritual eye salve on your eyes that you might see. Then he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. In other words, I still love you. I haven't abandoned you. 
even though you make me sick, I haven't abandoned you. Therefore, be zealous and repent. See, the lukewarm believer, carnal Christian, if you want to use that term, makes the Lord sick and wants to disassociate from them. The people here, rich in worldly goods, self-deceived because they're spiritually poor, blind and naked. The servant on the mount contrasts this with those who will be blessed. In Matthew 5, 3 it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Those who are rich often don't see the need for spiritual things or for salvation. They believe that money can buy you anything. I pray that none of us here are rich in goods but spiritually destitute. So, what's the, what's the advice to the church in summary? They're counseled to seek spiritual wealth in Christ. They're naked. They're urged to put on imputed righteousness that can only be obtained at the cross. They're spiritually blind. They're exhorted to spiritually see. Having been saved, are we still poor of sight? Those who Christ love, loves are those who follow his commandments. The Lord disciplines those who are his friends so that they may change their mind and become zealous for the faith. And then there is that famous verse, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. I've used it myself. How many times do we hear an evangelist or a pastor use that phrase? Jesus stands at the door of your heart and knocks, just open your heart. But it wasn't said to unbelievers. It was said to Christians. It was said to believers. Open the door of your heart and let Christ come in. There's a painting, I think, that says it all and it has Christ standing knocking at the door and the artist had spiritual insight the door doesn't have any handle on the outside Jesus won't open the door of your heart you have to open the door of your heart to let him in he's willing to have real table, ship, uh, table fellowship with his followers but because he is holy, there can be no compromise or contamination with defilement allowed. That's clearly illustrated in the Israelite scriptures in Leviticus 18.24. Do not defile yourselves by any of these things, for by all these the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. The Nicolaitans of Pergamum and Ephesus, those who claimed we will eat, were willing to engage in unqualified and totally unrestricted fellowship with Roman paganism, which was forbidden by the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. Many Laodicean followers of the Jewish Christ also apparently fell prey to the Nicolaitan teachings, though that's not explicitly identified with them as it was with the others. Now, basically, uh, the Nicolaitans taught a version of Gnosticism which says matter is evil, spirit is good, right, without going any further than that. Therefore, what you do in your body doesn't affect your spirit. So you can go along and you can engage in all of these orgies and whatever you want to do and it'll not affect your spirit. That was their teaching. You know, of course, once you start to do things like that in your body, it does affect your spirit. 
and you become complacent and eventually you'll become cold. You might even become part of the frozen chosen. Jesus called them to repentance and he offered them the greatest possible incentive. The personal right to table fellowship with Jesus Christ himself. Fellowship with Israel's God must remain pure. Nothing has changed. The holy is still holy. And in verse 21 and 22, To him who overcomes I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I believe that's the greatest promise to any of the seven churches. Christ is at the right hand of the Father, the place of commendation. To be seated is one of appointment. God invites Jesus to sit at his right hand until he made his enemy his footstool. And now Jesus has promised to the overcomers at Laodicea, the lukewarm church, if they can become hot, they will sit with Christ on his throne or at his right hand or wherever. If you like, the the seat of highest authority. Whilst the majority of the Laodicean type church which we have today will go through the tribulation as unbelievers the believers will sit with Christ in a place of honour and at the present moment we as believers are at the right hand of the Father in Christ it's a place of great security if the Laodicean church is seen as a picture of the present day church universal There's a lot there for us to consider. And, well, I suppose, what does it mean for us? Well, we need to seek and maintain a close personal relationship with Jesus. When our spiritual eye becomes singular upon him, our body will be filled with the light of Christ. The abundance of spiritual food exceeds all that of previous generations. The Laodiceans had a few things like letters from Paul and stories brought to them by apostles, by other preachers and so on. But we have a completed Bible We've got Christian books, we've got videos, we've got CDs. Are we making full use of what's available to us to build ourselves in our faith or to encourage others or to draw others? We've got more tools today than what they had then except perhaps the zeal to do it. So become zealous for the Lord. Lack of zeal was a root problem in Laodicea. By the same token, avoid the hype and stand with sound teaching of the word. Now in some churches there's all sorts of hype that goes on and they sing and they dance and I don't have any problems with that provided that they're sound on the word and that they're genuine in what they're doing and not just seeking personal attention. But there are also many churches around who use hype to draw people. And yes, they can claim they've had so many decisions for Christ. Do they continue to walk with Christ? Is there a sound teaching of the word to support it? If it's just hype, it won't last. The people won't last. They'll fall away. You need sound teaching of the word 
to support anything else that is happening in the church. I mean, one day we might see Albert get so excited that he stands up and he dances in the aisles. Now you might think, no, that won't happen. Who knows what happens if God puts his finger on him to do it? But he's still very, very firmly grounded in the word. That's the point. You've got to be firmly grounded in the word. The rest of it is just things that might happen along the way sometimes. Be rich in the things of God and not of this world. Get the focus right. And of course you avoid false teaching and false doctrine that can lead even the strongest astray. So, okay, how do we recognise false teaching and false doctrine? Well, I sort of found this and I made a bit of a, a PowerPoint out of a whole series of things. But to me, they are things that all point towards a church that is heading or has false doctrine or false teaching. Firstly, you get some where there's a denial of God. You get some where there's a denial of Christ. If you tie those two, two together, oh, you can come to, come to heaven any way you like. doesn't matter whether you're a Buddhist or a Hindu or a uh, spiritualist. Or you just believe that the universe governs everything. That's all false. He who says there is no God is a fool. Now that's not talking about intellectual deficiency. That's talking about spiritual deficiency. They don't recognise that there is a creator. Denial of Christ's return. Denial of the faith. Denial of sound doctrine. Denial of the separated life. Yes, we are sanctified at the time of believing. It tells us that in 1 Corinthians 1. But there is a practical sanctification that goes with it. And that practical sanctification is something that we have to work on as we live our life daily. To walk with the Lord. Now, none of us reach that stage of perfection. And we're not likely to in this world. But if you keep aiming for the goal, you will achieve it eventually. When Christ returns... But keep aiming, keep aiming. Runners always run to win, whether they do or not. Keep running. The denial of Christian liberty. Oh, you're bound by the law. No, you're not. You're bound by the love of Christ. Denial of spirituality. That's a little bit like the Sadducees. There's no resurrection. That's very sad, you see. And if there's no spirituality, well, what's the point of it all? If it just becomes a little happy club where you meet together on Sunday to have morning tea. And another one, denial of authority. That's denial of the authority of the Lord, the denial of the authority of Scripture. And there are places that do that. There are some who teach that the Bible is not the Word of God. 
It only contains the word of God. So it's like a buffet. You can pick what you like and leave what you don't. Or it becomes the word of God. Don't ask me how that one works. It is the word of God. If you don't believe it is the word of God, you're going down a wrong path. Oh, could we talk about this all day? But I think at that stage, I might say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the truth of your word, and we thank you, Lord, for the examples that you've given us. And even though the Laodiceans and their faults and the things that you pointed out to them, it rang home very, very true to them. But, Lord, the principles remain the same. We need to open our hearts to let you in. We need to apply spiritual eye salve that we might see. We need to have ears that are open to hear your word. Not just listen to the words, but hear what the words are saying. That's listening. Have a listening ear and an open heart. Lord, we pray that today that that might be the case for each and every one of us. In your precious name, amen.